Hi there. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about the end of the Heian period and the emergence of a whole new social order that occurs during what's known as the Kamakura period. In the Kamakura period, we see the destruction and the end of the imperial way of life as the center of life in imperial Japan. And we see a shift toward the power of the shogun and the samurai court. Now, the samurai had always had the economic and the military power in Japan. They were the feudal lords on the periphery of the kingdom, the empire, and they were there to collect the taxes and maintain order. There was a lot of feuding that went on between the different factions of the samurai courts. Um, they resented who was closer to or further away from the emperor and the seat of power. And so these tensions had been boiling for many decades until they broke out in the, what's known as the Genpei War between two of these feuding clans, the Tiara and the Minamoto. Now, the Tiara had been uh, very sort of controlling of the emperor, and it was the Minamoto who were able to dislodge the ti Tiara and gain power at this time. And they sort of established the emperor and their court, but they are the ones who are really kind of now calling the shots. They are keeping the taxes and sort of putting aside some allowance for the emperor. But really, the real cultural shift happens at this time as they build a whole new capital further to the north and west on the main island of Honshu in the region known as Kamakura, which is just a little south of Tokyo today. So this Bafuku tent government was ruled over by a shogun who was sort of elected or by the daimyo, who are these feudal lords who collectively came together. Being a samurai was a honor that was passed down through father to son, and so this hereditary tradition meant that these people were lifelong military leaders and that they, this was a job that they sort of really were born into and maintained this uh, class structure. And for the samurai, they're very much about control and order, but they're also about power. And power is represented in a very different way. They have been on the periphery, and now this huge cultural change emerges where a whole different kind of aesthetics uh, come about due to the new patronage of the shogun and the samurai court. To begin with, we actually have these portraits that emerge, whereas during the Heian period, portraiture was considered among the elites at the emperor's court. We saw in the women's pictures these kind of very gentle, very vague pictures of people without really describing individuals. Now we're seeing this very realistic portraiture, this nisei, this likeness picture. People in positions of power wanted to be identified as the people who had the power. So we see this very striking uh, portrait of the shogun of the Minamoto no Yoritomo by Fujiwara Takanobu. And this is from about the 12th century. We see um, this very striking black kimono that kind of cloud like a bat. He kind of hovers in the space, but his face, you know, white and very starkly, uh, dramatically kind of stands out. I want to point this out. This is a really wonderful design quality. We'll see a great deal in Japanese aesthetics. It's a word they call no ten. This sort of contrast between light and dark, which creates these very dramatic shapes and forms. And it sort of is a part of a very distinctive aesthetic that uh, emerges in Japan. 
part of what this change is also about is not just the ego of the shogun, uh, but also this new sensibility of kind of frankness and honesty from this uh, emergence of this new religion of Buddhism, uh, Zen. Now, Zen, we've talked about, a little, we'll talk about a little bit more later, but it is an evolution of this Chan Buddhism from China, this Chan Buddhism that's all about spontaneity. Well, here we, now we see the sense of frankly looking at the warts and all of these people, that they're just, they're not meant to be idealized, they're not meant to be put on a throne. In fact, looking at the imperfections makes you look past their humanity to their deeper wisdom and spiritual knowledge. There is a lot of kind of burly, masculine uh, sculpture, and painting, warriors become a primary theme, and these dramatic statues, these guardians of Buddhism, become a prominent feature in many Buddhist temples. There's always these two kings, the Niyo, uh, they are flank the right and the left of the the gateway into the temple. This is a masterful creation by the carver Unke, who was able to kind of develop this new way of sculpting with cypress wood. Cypress wood is a very dense wood that has an even grain. It's very easy to carve relatively. It takes its form. It's impervious to uh, rot or insects, and it's really very easy and he would piece together these things you can see how some of the wood has been kind of laminated together allowing for very large and dramatic um, pieces of, of statues in this way and so this became this new major way of doing sculpture during the Kamakura period. Unke wanted this kind of realistic sense of power while the musculature is not entirely anatomically correct. There's a kind of rippling energy, a kind of fury and power that these figures in their swirling robes depict. One on the right we see here, uh, opposite of this, is always got his mouth open, the Kongo, and the Mishaku always has his mouth closed. That's how you can sort of tell them apart. Other interesting detail is that these sort of uh, dark crystals were put in the eyes to make them kind of sparkle with a kind of fury and violence. In this way, realism is uh, just wonderfully observed uh, statues. This is a really particularly startling picture of a kunya, uh, this very important priest preaching. He's actually in the act of speaking. And this wire that comes out, we see a series of six little Buddhas um, standing on this wire that emerges out from his mouth. The six Buddhas symbolize the idea of the six sibyls, syllables of the Nembutsu, uh, which is this phrase, Namu Amida Butsu, meaning praise to Amida Buddha. And this is the the phrase that is uttered by people in the Pure Land Buddhist sect who are hoping to gain access to this Pure Land by chanting praise to Amida Butsu. And so Namu Amida Butsu, by saying this phrase, uh, it becomes this. And so this why this, these six Buddhas that come up here for each of the syllables of that phrase uh, is a very important way in which you can physicalize this idea of sound emanating. There's also a wonderful stance, a kind of sense of presence, and the figure, the way they are putting the, their chin forward as if you can feel the force of their voice uh, emerging from their body. Here is another important deity of the Kamakura period, uh, again cut, carved in cypress wood. We have this sort of elegant warrior character holding a stupa in one hand and a staff in a sense of power and control, standing on a lion you see beneath him, the sense of mastery over the world. Uh, these are the sorts of ideas and symbols of power that the Kamakura samurai 
were wanting to perpetuate that feeling of them as sort of champions of the culture and the heritage of Japan and this sense of being in control and Buddhism uh, sort of lent its power, its idea of its notion of authority to this Kamakura governments. Of course, the real power that the samurai achieved was not just symbolic, it was also very real. That came from the samurai swords, which were incredibly deadly. These weapons they had uh, uh, adapted from Chinese designs. They made them, instead of double-edged swords, they made them single-edged swords. They gave them this elegant swooping curve. And then this very ingenious design by laminating the two different kinds of metals together. You were able to create a very durable and incredibly sharp weapon. The soft metal core was able to keep the, sh the blade from breaking. And then this sort of hardened point was so sharp it could really cut through anything. And so these weapons were really sort of this deadly force that, uh, you know, propelled the samurai into these uh, incredibly violent battles that happened very fast. If you're at all familiar with sort of samurai movies, maybe you've seen the samurai soldiers charging in and the battles happen all very quickly. And indeed, that was the case because a single blow from a samurai weapon would very much likely kill you. Your death would be, you'd hope, instantly, or at the very least, you would lose a limb um, that would make you um, unable to fight on. And this is very different from uh, the medieval weapons, which instead of going toward hardened weapons in Europe, they created heavier, softer steel that didn't break. But then they would basically be like hitting someone with a metal club. You couldn't cut through the person. You had to just sort of beat them down and then sort of stab them with a small knife. And so they had these very long, arduous battles. Uh, so in the samurai culture, the speed and suddenness of these battles gave them a kind of intensity of focus, a kind of uh, urgency to be prepared for death at any moment. And this is where the idea of Zen Buddhism comes into the samurai culture. And we talk more about that in a moment. Let's go on more about the samurai sword. Now, like many important things in Japanese culture, the samurai sword can be completely taken apart into its component elements and cleaned and reassembled. The same is true of kimonos, and as the same is true of that uh, building, remember the Shinto building, the shrines to the, God, the kami spirit of the sun, that temple also, by being rebuilt, is its power is replenished and refreshed. And so the sword can be dismantled into its component parts and then carefully cleaned and rebuilt. There is the various different designs. Uh, the most common you hear about is the katana, which is, is sort of one-handed or uh, the tachi, the two-handed sword. Uh, much of the artwork of the blade is really found in the suba, which is the guard at the, the point where the handle meets the blade. There's a lot of art and design and decoration that went into these, especially in later years as wars became less and less frequent, uh, and these weapons became more and more symbols of power. The ornamentation played a very important role in projecting the status of the samurai. Now, there are a lot of people who've talked about the philosophy of the samurai, and this is called Bushido, the way of the Bushi, the warriors. Bushido is often uh, talked about or written about in terms of it being a kind of lost ideal that in the past people understood their place 
and their their responsibilities but today everyone is so lazy and nobody seems to care about true honor or true dignity so with those kinds of caveats it makes you wonder how much people actually followed this code now of course if you are familiar with movies and other kind of cultural uh, aspects of Japan it seems like everybody is always talking about you know the samurai ethos and the samurai ways of life but I, I just want to hazard a slight warning that the ideal and the reality may be two different things but let's talk about what this Bushido is in its ideal in its ideal it is summed up in a very important book by Yamato Tsunitomo the Hagakuri in the 17th century now this book again written at a time when there had been very little war and people had largely forgotten about samurai ethos he says the way of the samurai is found in death and this idea is to explain that you have to like a Buddhist monk accept the idea that you're going to die that all things are impermanent and that you have to have the honor to recognize your failings and be willing to uh, accept ultimate punishment for any uh, disobedience or dishonor that is brought upon your clan and so these are really powerful ideas that meant that people went to war uh, fully understanding they probably would not return uh, either they would die in battle or they if lost they would uh, you know bringing dishonor upon their family through failure um, they would be forced to kill themselves now there's a lot that's been talked about this idea of suicide among the samurai and also this sort of way in which someone would be forced to commit suicide that they would be literally ordered to commit suicide uh, both of these actions are extremely violent ways of dying if you were to bring dishonor on your family and the family uh, had to accept your dishonor you would feel compelled or you would be honor uh, honor bound to commit seppu which is this idea of ritual suicide or which is often referred to harikiri which is the more crude word which means just cut open your gut and that's essentially what you do you would take a shorter sword and you would insert into the diaphragm and you would cut your diaphragm away from your rib cage allowing yourself to suffocate okay it's a very slow extremely painful way to die now if they felt any kind of sorrow for your death and they felt like you actually were doing the honorable thing uh, they might take you out of your misery by cutting off your head after you'd made those incisions but I wouldn't count on that so there's a very ceremonial way in which people were made to face their death and commit ritual suicide is a really sort of harsh and uh, intense way in which the samurai ethos was maintained now Zen Buddhism is not a violent religion and it is not uh, Zen Buddhism that promotes this idea of ritual seppuku but Zen Buddhism has an idea uh, that you must be present in the world if you remember Chan Buddhism back in China there was the story of the Bodhidharma who came to China and taught people that they were doing it all wrong that you can't just become enlightened by learning about the life of Buddha you needed to be wholly present you needed to change your attitude your physical body to clarify your mental presence of everything in your life now in Japan this Bodhidharma is known as Daruma and the Daruma is as you see depicted here in this hanging scroll from the late 16th century he has these sort of piercing eyes this kind of ugly countenance with this balding head and this big bushy beard and this glowering stare and he is said that he cut off his own eyelids so that he would not sleep 
and that he planted his eyelids in the ground and they turned into tea leaves. And so there's this wonderful way in which there's a kind of a sympathetic magic, the tea which makes you and keeps you awake, uh, is a part of that important meditation that for staying alert and not drifting off to sleep during meditation. Now the kesa is one of the few possessions that a Buddhist monk would have. Buddhist uh, monks lived a very simple, humble existence, but their kesa might be actually rather extravagant. As you see, this one here has gold uh, embroidery and fine silk and uh, is very kind of symbolic outer garment that is meant to be a kind of a symbol of their vows uh, of to the Buddhist order. So the kesa becomes... Uh, you know, a very important sort of formal uh, attire that the Buddhists would wear as a symbol of their devotion to Buddhism, but also it becomes a part of their individual expression. And if they are really wealthy or come from a wealthy family, you might see some really fancy silk brocades or um, gold stitching in them as well. Now, there are many different ways that people uh, approached Zen Buddhism. Uh, one very unique way, which you may have heard of before, I'm going to elucidate now. And this is a process of meditation known as the koan. Now, the koan was an idea that had been around for a long time, but it really becomes a kind of formalized uh, by this uh, one Zen Buddhist teacher, Haku Enkaku. And his very favorite koan was the one he illustrated here, where you see the monk with his hand up, and, he, and the inscription says, What is the sound of one hand clapping? Now, if you think about this question for more than a second, you realize that it's a ridiculous question. One hand doesn't clap. Well, you might slap your fingers against your palm and make something like a clap. A true clap is, by definition, two hands. And so it doesn't say, you know, can one hand clap? That is a simple answer, no. The question is phrased in such a way that it suggests that one hand can clap by asking you the sound. Well, the sound might be silence, where you might think, well, one hand can't make a sound that we can hear. Or you might think of a way of realizing that one hand clapping is not even a sound that we can hear with our ears. These kinds of ways in which people might begin to delve into this absurd question, which really, truthfully, does not have an answer, was a way in which the Zen Buddhist monk would try and break down their logical mind, their rational mind, and enter into a kind of meditation on a, this sort of absurd premise. The idea was to bring about a kind of revelation that might lead to enlightenment. That this process of meditating on the koan, it was kind of intellectual, but it was also a, a way in which someone would sort of break down their rational thinking. And it's a question you don't you don't ponder. It's a question that you sort of rest on your mind on in your meditation, allowing the feelings uh, to emerge that lead you to a deeper understanding. So this is a really interesting idea that Zen Buddhism proposes. And this lovely drawing here, you can see how simply it's rendered with the quick brush strokes representing the robe and this wonderful monk here with his, his Elmer Fudd bald head and this 
sweet smile. There's something sort of humorous at the same time profound about what we are looking at. Hakuin Ikaku was a very influential Zen Buddhist monk and painter, and a lot of his um, paintings became very important ways in which he was able to teach and talk about Buddhism. Uh, one of his famous scrolls is called 100 Demons, and the idea is that we must go through a hundred demons before we finally sort of realize ourselves that these are the blocks or the things that hinder us from a deeper recognition of who we really are. So by painting these demons, these playful, absurd, ridiculous demons, some of them partially hidden, some of them, you know, causing trouble, we get this sense that he's trying to kind of come to terms with the dirt demons of his own life. Another very important idea in Zen Buddhism was not just this koan meditation on the absurd, but also a practice whereby a monk would engage in a task, a chore, a simple repetitive thing that is being done, and by being wholly present in that task, thinking nothing except that task, putting themselves entirely in the present, they were able to achieve a kind of way toward enlightenment. Now here's a painting by Kaoninga, a monk sewing from the Kamakura period. Now in this really lovely painting, we see this monk with this kind of riveted gaze. He's looking directly at the point of the needle. And his thread is just beautifully taut, as it seems like the, the precision, the way he's holding the needle, there's a kind of incredible care and precision with what he's doing. But what is he actually sewing? And I think this is the thing that's so very telling about the way in which the cloth that he's rendering has been given this kind of slashing, quick gestural brushwork that suggests it's nothing of any importance. He's not really making anything. He's just sewing, sewing for the sake of sewing. And he's being present in the act of sewing for no other reason than to be present through sewing. That sewing becomes the vehicle of his meditation. And this is a very interesting idea that you think about that people, you know, this non-productive labor, this way in which the act of doing something becomes a way through to realizing yourself and to staying focused and becoming better focused in what you are about. And this was a very widespread practice in Japan, and it had a huge impact on the arts. This is coupled with this earlier philosophical tradition I mentioned, where it's this idea of finding the universe in a grain of sand. Well, this sort of expands on that idea that by through this simple task of just sewing, someone can realize their whole self and their whole being. Other kinds of practices that Zen Buddhist monks or samurai who are practicing Zen Buddhism would be Kudo. Now, at the time, uh, archery in the early Kamakura period was a very important military uh, tool. Uh, the bow in Japan is this very large asymmetrical bow. It's the only asymmetrical bow in the world, where about one-third of the bow is lower and two-thirds of the bow. The bow is also pulled far further than most bows, which usually go up to either the chin or the corner of the mouth. This is packed behind the head, and it has this powerful grip that it requires to shoot these bows. And so Kudo, this technique of the mastery of the bow was a very important military skill. 
But even later, after the intervention and the introduction of, of uh, firearms and gunpowder and cannons, and the bow is no longer used, the bow becomes a kind of spiritual way in which people practice their approach to um, Zen Buddhism. Now, I want to introduce to you a very important art in Japan uh, that emerges at the court of the Kamakura Samurai. This is no drama. No drama was a theater form that evolved out of ancient rites and rituals that were performed at the emperor's court called Kagura. They were also um, other kinds of rituals and performances that were done in the countryside, Bugaku and Sarugaku. These were the rituals that were done um, for Shinto rites and Buddhist rites. Now, Sarugaku was the immediate predecessor to no drama, and nobody's quite sure what the name meant, but it really translates literally as monkey dance. So the original theater was performed in the countryside, and it may have been rather kind of energetic and very sort of wild, who knows. But monkey dance, when it's taken to court under the patronage of the samurai, they love the theater but they don't like the name so much, so they change it to now called No. And No means skill, and is a kind of mastery of, of performance that is exhibited through No Drama. Now, the two men who were chiefly responsible for building up and maintaining the art of the No Theater at the court of the samurai was Kanami Kyoto Tsugo, and Zeami Motokyo, his son. Kanami dies when Zeami is still young, and it's really Zeami who brings the full flowering of No and is probably the most influential practitioner of the art of No throughout its entire history. Now, the No Theater is a masked theater, but it is only one character type that performs with the masks. All of the other performers who are not the lead performer or known as the shite or doer do not wear masks. So the shite is the, the main focus of the performance. There is a waki, a person who sort of introduces the drama and interacts mostly with the lead performer, but the waki is this kind of by the side witness to what the shite, the doer, is doing. There's also a kind of villager who plays um, a kind of more ordinary person, comic relief, kyogen actor in the performance. Shite isn't meant to be funny. It is, in fact, a play of great tragic significance. And the kyogen actor plays a very small and subdued role. There is another kind of theater that is exclusively focused on the Kyogen that is coupled with No, and that is a tradition we don't have time to talk about, but the Kyogen comic performers, they have their own performance tradition that is played in tandem with the No theater. So now the No stage you can see here the performers. You have the shite who's in the main stage, the waki who is the witness over on the right by the pillar. We have the chorus, which is called the jiotai. We have the musicians who are called the hayashi. And then we have stage assistants who literally get up in the middle of the show and hand things or help performers change the costumes, whatever needs to happen, the koken on stage actually do it while the play is taking place. There is also a kind of walkway called the hashigakari on the stage. Now, the performers you see on this diagram here, they start in the area of one, which is the mirror room, and there they perform and get in character, and then they walk across this pathway, the hashigakari, 
pass three pine trees and enter the stage. So there's a sort of this dramatic entrance, the sort of passageway to the theater performing space. And that movement toward the space is a part of the play. It's part of the, the way in which people are oriented to first introduced to the characters is through their announcing I am so and so and I'm on my way to so so place and this is my journey. And so this passageway is how they will make that journey. Let's look a little more at some of the masks in the no theater. The masks in the no theater are very stylized. They have very peculiar shapes on the face and forehead. While they look fundamentally realistic, there's a stylization in the shape of the mouth and the chin and the cheeks and the way the eyes are set that creates something a little disturbing. So this is what the mask would look like, a female mask would look like under electric light. But to really understand this mass tradition Sorry, I'm having trouble here. to really understand this mass tradition you need to see it how it was intended to be seen through a kind of candlelight or torchlight and here you can see the face as it would appear in that kind of a lighting and suddenly it doesn't seem so strange. There's a softness, there's an incredible naturalism. The shadows of the face seem to create a, a kind of play of emotions. And that's what's really incredible about this way these faces are crafted. They're designed in such a way that by looking up the face appears sad and that by looking down the face appears happy. So there's a kind of way in which the performer can shift the gaze of the mask to change the expression on the face. Now, this diagram I'm showing you here was actually done by these scientists who took a computer model of a no mask and they compared it to a similar natural human face. And they found that the no mask exhibited these traits of changing expression, whereas a human face naturally does not. So there's something in the artistry of the no mask that provides this opportunity for this range of expression. In fact, if you ask Japanese viewers about the emotions they're seeing, they will say they see several different emotions. They can see happiness, they can see sadness, they can see happiness tinged with sadness, and sadness tinged with happiness. So the Ona mask is uh, an important uh, mask in these performances. All the masks, uh, all the characters are uh, played by men. And what's peculiar about these performances these men give is that they don't pretend to be women per se. I mean, they're not speaking in a higher tone of voice. They're not changing their body in a way that appears to be the illusion of a woman. They are still who they are, and they're presenting their, their a, a kind of stylized theatrical voice but not one that is sort of imitative of a female character. So this lack of illusion is a really interesting thing. You can even see this in the way the mask is adhered to the face. There's a very clear, large band that shows that the mask is there. There's no way attempt to hide the fact that this person has got a, a thing on their face. You can actually see the sides of their face and their hair underneath the mask. And this lack of illusion is one of the most extraordinary things about Japanese theater. In fact, I cannot think of any other theater in the world that has developed this incredible aesthetic of the denial of illusion. Another very powerful and compelling mask you often see are these Hanya masks. The Hanya mask is this sort of violent, 
the jealous female character. And you see these barred teeth and these long horns and this vicious gaze. This is a jealous woman who has been wronged and she is out for revenge. This is probably the most terrifying character in the no character uh, pantheon. And this has to do with the way in which these samurai may have been feeling rather guilty of some jilted women that they left behind. The no performers uh, also wear kimonos, and uh, the kimonos are a little simpler, more elegant. They don't have that sort of large expanse of cloth that the emperor's court kimonos had, and this simpler cleaner lined kimonos allowed for more expressive body movement. And so the kimono is uh, a, a garment that is made of a series of panels that are really base stitched together, meaning they're designed so that the entire garment can be taken apart back into its component parts, individually washed and re-sewn. And that's why these, these uh, kimonos last for such a very long time. Now, I want to talk about this idea of this lack of illusion that occurs in the no theater. We've seen that in the way the mask is worn. We can see that in the way the performers <clears throat> do not attempt to hide the fact that they are men performing women's roles. And we can also see it in the sort of stage properties that are placed uh, in the performance. There's no attempt to create the actual illusion of a boat or a real bell or an actual bush on stage. There's a kind of cage or framework or clearly handmade thing designed to have a way in which we look at it appear to be a thing and not the illusion of the thing. And a very important idea that Zayami, our you know, philosopher, director, actor, playwright, who was so important to no drama, Zayami said, the truth and what it looks like are two different things. Now, this is a Buddhist idea, and it suggests that the world we live in is an illusion. That is, we are clouded by our desires, that we see the things in this world the way we do because we want permanence and we want order and we want stability. And so the way we see things uh, makes it impossible for us to achieve enlightenment because we are sort of clouded by desire in this way. And so the truth, the deeper truth that lies beyond the way things appear is something that we don't have immediate access to. So in the no theater, you don't want to create an imitation of the world that we see in our lives every day because that is itself an illusion. And so to recreate that on stage is to create, in a sense, an illusion of an illusion. So the only way to appreciate the deeper truths that are being addressed in the no theater is to try and find a way to see past the mere appearances of things to the deeper truth that lies behind them. Another very important idea in Zen Buddhism has been this idea of the dry garden. Japanese gardens is a, an extraordinary huge topic. I'm only going to talk about this one particular variety of gardens in Japan, the dry garden, which is very austere um, sand field with some mossy rocks arranged within this. And the most famous of these dry gardens is the Ruanji Temple of the Peaceful Dragon, which was assembled in 1473 by Soami in 1499. Now, Soami was a Zen Buddhist monk, 
uh, a painter, a calligrapher, and he set about this task to design a garden in a courtyard that was a little bit larger than a sort of a tennis court. And in it, he assembled uh, these rocks very carefully, presented them in such a way, the 15 stones in various patterns, so that as you walk through this space and look at the various rocks in the garden, you cannot see all the rocks at the same time. From whatever place you stand, one or another of the rocks is hidden from view, so that your sense of what you're seeing is changing as you move through the space, that there is a sense of the progress, a kind of movement through the space that is important to your full realization, just in the idea that as you are on a journey, that we are in this process toward enlightenment, that we cannot see ultimately where we will end up from where we are because we cannot fully appreciate the distance we have to gain our enlightenment. Another very important idea in Zen Buddhism was the enso and the, the painting of a circle. There's nothing more simple than painting a, a circle, uh, and yet there's nothing that, that says more powerfully the idea of who you are in that moment than that simple gesture. And so Zen Buddhist monks would just paint a circle, and that circle would reveal their state of mind, their presence, their being there. Now, sometimes the circle is a single loop, or in the case here by Banke Otaku, we see he's done these two hoops, and he's written an inscription, Sakyamuni and Maritreya are servants. And so he's talking about these two important ideas, Sakyamuni, uh, the Gautama Siddhartha, and Maritreya, the Buddha to come, are servants. By talking about them as servants, he's saying that they share a common role, which is the unity of Buddha. So even though he's made his circle in two parts, he's really talking about a kind of greater unity that comes from these to Sakyamuni and Maritreya. So the circle becomes a kind of allegory for Buddhism itself. Here is another example by Sengai Gibbon. And this is a series of geometric shapes, the circle, the triangle, and the square. Now, what I find really fascinating about this very famous painting and its wonderful simplicity is that you can actually see how it was painted, that he didn't go back and re-dip his brush. There's the circle was painted, and you can see the clockwise arc of the circle going from dark to light. We can see each of the individual brush strokes of the triangle, and then finally, the square and it, the brush is just beginning to dry out. It's like he's got the final vestiges of ink to finish his square. And so it's this wonderful sense of movement from right to left that sort of shows us this progression from a kind of unity of the circle to the greater and greater complexity of the square. And he's talking about that sense of as we move through life and we become engaged in the world and we become attached to things, our sense of reality is shifted away from the greater unity from the beginning.